once we get past the awkwardness and the shame or the embarrassment of talking about sex, it becomes really comfortable. Like you're literally talking about the weather. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I think I said in my master class, like it's sunny with a chance of orgasm. I like love really, that. And usually in this porn, there's a plot. You're like, I don't want to just see her sleeping with her ski instructor. I want to see how they met. <laughs> Oh, Does wow. She really there's like a backstory. There's a backstory. Wait, this is cool. I kind of want to. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just interested. Shanita, it's like what are we young, doing and, young and the Restless. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Kind of a, yeah. a drama to it. Yeah. 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 Welcome to another episode of 8020. My name is Georgia Sinclair and this is Shanina Shaik. And we are coming to you from the beautiful spring place in Beverly Hills this season. Today we have a guest on and Shanina and I have been so excited so <laughs> to have this guest for a very long time now. Mm -hmm. uh, her name is Emily Morse. You may also be familiar with her as Sex with Emily. Uh, she's been a podcaster, an author, a speaker, for how long now? Uh, 19 years. Well, yeah, you've had I the podcast 20. 19 years. Yeah. That blows my mind. I didn't even know that podcasts were around 19 years ago, but you must yeah. have been one of the first. Uh, you know what? Yeah, I was one of the first people doing podcasts. Definitely the first sex education podcast. And yeah, it started out, really, I was doing a documentary about sex. And at the time I had heard about podcasting and I thought, well, there's so much like shame and embarrassment around podcasting or talking about sex. I mean, talking about there's taboo and shame. And I thought, well, how great to do an audio format without cameras and people can call in and share their stories. I mean, now obviously we have cameras, but back then it just, it really was the perfect medium. And it actually still is. Yeah, and I you didn't podcasting. just stop talking about sex. You're a doctor of human sexuality. I'm a doctor of human sexuality. But here's the thing. When I started, I started out just very curious about sex I hadn't had a lot of sex education. I found myself having sex and it was just underwhelming. And I didn't know what I was doing really. And I thought I should really know. Why does it seem like guys are having a good time? My partner's always having a good time, but I'm not as much. I wasn't mm -hmm. having orgasms. And it turns out I was, I was actually faking orgasms. My mm -hmm. sex was a lot more performative. So when I started out, I just had people in the studio and I was asking them questions about sex. But then I went to back to school and got my doctorate in human sexuality. Wow. wow. Okay. That's so relatable what you yeah. just said. Oh my God. You guys, performative I think sex. Performative. I was, I was the performative queen. Yeah. I was so good at it. I think all of us have been guilty of, and just not knowing and having the knowledge because, yeah. you know, and as we're young adults and teens and the boys at school, I remember like quietly showing, having porn videos and seeing women, they're like, okay, well, this is what the woman has yeah. to do to enjoy sex right? and then you get this idea it's like well I guess I have to do that yeah. to show that I'm good at sex and pleasuring my partner so these are the things but obviously going into it you don't know much about what's going on like and you're saying like we women perform a lot during sex mm -hmm. um how do we how do women enjoy sex without performing ah oh, it's a great question so so the thing about let's just go back to the porn thing for a second the problem with porn and porn has some great uses. It can be a turn on. It's fun to watch with a partner sometimes and see, you know, what could be hot for us to try. It definitely is an arousal mechanism. But the problem with porn is that we don't have solid sex education anywhere. I would say in the States, but probably everywhere. They don't have great sex ed. So porn without sex education is a disaster because young people are seeing it and we're assuming that this is how I'm supposed to act. And since most porn is made by men, through a male gaze for men, they're not, they don't have a consciousness around what actually feels good to women. And now there are, there are more porn sites right now that are made by women for women. Um, but basically what we all grew up on was porn that was just showing stuff that, like I always look at the porn now, I'm like, he's nowhere near her clitoris. Like how is she moaning? This is not real life. And so mm -hmm. the first thing we have to do to get away from the performance and thinking that you have to moan in a certain way, you have to arch your back in a certain way, you have to do all of these things. You have to really get in touch with yourself. It starts with our own you know, um, familiarity and comfort with our own bodies mm -hmm. and our own sexuality. And there's nothing in anything, you know, in sex, the world right now that actually helps women do that. So, I mean, the work I've been doing for sure does that, but it is a process to get away from everything we've been told about sex and saying, what do I actually want? What feels good to me? And a great place to start with that is solo sex, mm -hmm. AKA masturbation. 
Um, I love the term solo sex, though, because it's just more like it's more about you. What mm -hmm. what do I like? What kind of touch do I like? What feels good to me? Do I actually know my body and what feels good? So, you know, it's a process. But that's the great way to start because then you'll know what feels good and then you can show your partner. I've Ooh. actually done your masterclass. You did? Amazing. <laughs> yeah, I remember it was your masterclass that actually attracted me to that platform because I was like, I believe that there's a common misconception out there that a lot of people think that they're born good at sex, which is horseshit, right? Yes, like, absolutely. <laughs> to there's learn. no good. Nobody is born a great lover. Right. Nobody is born good at sex. In fact, I would say there's no no such thing. To be good at sex, what that actually means is that you're somebody who's open, explorative, you know how to communicate, mm -hmm. you have worked on the shame that you have around sex in your body, and you can be present with whatever, whoever you're with, and learn how to, yeah, communicate, negotiate, and express your desires. Like, that's what a good lover, it's not all these fancy, like, how you perform oral sex, or how you move in the bedroom. That stuff comes later, but really it's about being an attentive, compassionate lover. Yeah. And we can all do that. Communication is really key in sex, right? Because yes, I don't like it. Everything. I'm going to be honest. I don't like going into a sexual, you know, episode and it's just quiet. Yeah. Well, you know, some communication and even after, is that healthy mm -hmm. or before? Well, that's a great question. So communication has actually been, it's funny because people are like, oh, you're always talking about all this wild sex stuff or that's what they assume when they hear sex. But most of what I do is talk about communication because without healthy communication around sex, it's it's really not going to be what either one of you want. Um, and so I always say communication is a lubrication because the more we talk about sex in a healthy way, the better sex we're going to have. And so learning just to talk about sex without making it awkward and comfortable is the first step. And so while in the bedroom, we can talk about specific things like, move to the left or to the right, or this, you know, this would feel better than that. Mm. Most of the helpful conversations we have about sex are done outside the bedroom. Yeah. And they're done like um, when we are, you know, I, I have these three T's of communication that I always talk about, timing, tone, and turf. And this is like your, your roadmap for how to have any awkward conversation about sex. And timing would be when you are hanging out, just the two of you. Maybe it's date night, although a lot of people don't have time for date night. Mm. Um, but it's a it's really great to have one night that you prioritize for yourself. It could be you're going on a walk, you're sitting at the couch. Mm. So timing, when you are hanging out and chill. The tone is compassionate and open mm -hmm. and curious. And your turf, again, outside the bedroom. So keep the bedroom for sleeping and sex. But when we have these conversations in the bedroom and we're like, how come you never want to have sex with me? Or you should try this move. If we're in an arousal state, it can be really hard to process the information to yeah. hear what your partner says. And so these conversations are great to have with your partner just saying, hey, and a great place to start is if you've never talked about sex. And I'm going to tell you, honestly, most couples, so I don't want people to feel bad about this, haven't talked about sex in a healthy, in a way that is going to move the needle on their sex life. It's going to mm. improve their sex life. And so we could really just say, I was listening to the 80-20 podcast today because people, I always tell, or I was listening to Sex with Emily. I always say, blame me. Say, I realize, babe, that we haven't talked about our sex life a lot. We haven't really talked about, you know, what we both like and what turns us on. Is that something you'd be interested in? Like, you could start there. Mm -hmm. Like, And then I have a lot of tools for how to move that conversation, but it really just starts with, I think we agree we both want to be great lovers to each other. Like, what can we do to make sure we're stay connected? Yeah. Yes. I'm glad that you mentioned the three T's because you talk about those in your masterclass. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just I'm just thinking back to it because I watched yeah. it a while ago and then I watched part of it again last night. But the reason I was drawn to it is because I thought, well, there's this fantastic tool there and, you know, I'm a very curious person. I wonder what tips and tricks I can pick up on how to improve my sex life. And that that was the biggest takeaway that I got from your masterclass was communicate, 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 yeah. talk. Talk about it and then talk about it again and think about and And to go a little bit deeper with that, it's more like understanding 
what's worked for us? Like, what is the most memorable times we've had sex and mm. why? Like, that would unpack certain things. Like, oh, I loved it because we had time, mm. because we were on vacation. Mm. Um, there was a lot of oral sex, or there was a lot of playful buildup, right? So, so just understanding what are the, like, reverse engineering, what are the things that are going to get me turned on, that get me in the mood? What kind of touch do I like? And so... You're kind of sharing that with your partner and fear figure that's why we went back to solo sex figuring out ourselves but and i have a lot of great tools i have a book that came out last year called smarts last year yeah it's a new year smart sex <laughs> yeah. i'm thinking um smart sex how to boost your sex iq and own your pleasure there's five pillars of sexual intelligence i talk about in there i talk about the another great tool is this yes no maybe list it's on my website it's sex with emily and it's basically like 80 sex acts and it has a yes by it and no or a maybe and you and your partner could sit down have a glass of wine and it has everything on there it i love dirty fun talk. quizzes maybe yeah it's a fun quiz <laughs> yeah right? i used to like, do that with my partner all the time yeah. when we met we were like you know just the questionnaires it's yeah quite, you get what, to know each other exactly yeah you I could, think this fun. is such a fun way to say like yeah. oh wow i didn't know you wanted to take a bath together or you wanted to talk dirty or spank more or you know whatever it is they're all on there some things you might have to look up but there's a lot of things. <laughs> and so that's just a great tool because I just want to give people, and then I have scripts in the book too about how to ask for specific things because, again, I get this as a whole, it's a, it's a whole new language, really. Mm -hmm. The mm. communication of sex is a language that a lot of us are not It's so interesting in. how women are so, I shouldn't say always, like we're self-absorbed thinking about the male all the time yes. and how, why hasn't the roles changed where males are not thinking about women and how to turn them on? I love that. This is this is yeah. the, this is a great start. Yeah. Like this is this conversation that we're having is a great start. You're absolutely right that most women we are caretakers. Yeah. That's just who we are. We are socialized that way. You know, what do our friends need? What does our family need? What do they, if we have a baby? What does our baby need? Like that all comes first. And then maybe if there's time, we'll take care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And everything we've seen growing up in movies and society has been like, how can I be a good wife? How can I be a good mom? I definitely think we're getting away from that. Mm -hmm. With some conversations we're having in the in the world today that we realize that women have a lot going on and we can be do everything. But when it comes to sex, it's sort of one of the last holdouts. Like women can still earn as much as a man and all those things. But when it comes to sex, until we dismantle this this belief that it has to be about the man, you know, we're not gonna get anywhere. So yeah, I think saying I want my pleasure to be important too and the good thing is that when men get this accurate information it's not to bash men mm. yeah they no. grew up on porn they grew up on all the stuff they don't know and women we we, we were complicit mm -hmm. we're like i don't know any differently so i guess it is about your pleasure because all i've seen when it comes to sex is porn or in the movies where you see a couple fall into bed, they get naked, they both have orgasms at the same time and fall asleep. Like, that's just not accurate when it comes to sex. So once we give people the information and we let men know that it takes a while for someone to get turned on, that women's, for example, like women are more like slow cookers, right? Men are frying pans when it comes to arousal, typically. <laughs> this, this shifts, but men can get turned on like that. Like mm -hmm. your partner sees you and he gets an erection. I'm talking about, you know, heterosexual relationships here. But for women, we take a little bit of while to get turned on and get ready and get aroused. It could take us between 20 and 40 minutes to orgasm or it can wow. take men about eight minutes. I was going to say that. You mentioned that in your masterclass and that was um, information I didn't know that I think it's, uh, for men to reach orgasm, the average time is like two minutes or something and for women it's 40, something like that? 20 to 40 minutes 20 to with, 40. Men, it's with a partner. And with men it's like eight to 10 minutes. Eight to 10, so okay, So there's sorry. an orgasm Two gap. minutes, sorry guys. <laughs> <laughs> so men take two minutes. I don't want a minute, man. Yeah. We can work on that. That that happens, but it's Maybe like I'm meeting the wrong yeah, guys. But it feels like <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. We've got a whole thing on premature ejaculation. We can talk about, but eight to ten minutes is about right. But you see right there, like the the indiscrepancy in that. You're like, oh well, wh how do we close this gap? So again, to get to, your, to get away from the performative is just like, or just thinking that we have to serve men is it coming armed with information and like mm -hmm. learning? Because once guys see that, oh, this is how you get turned on and all, like they want to be great lovers. They don't want you to be performative either. Like the, mm -hmm. the, the good guys are like, oh no, I genuinely want to see my partner like turned on and mm -hmm. aroused and in her body and mm -hmm. having pleasure like yeah. I am. 
But then we have to be the stewards of that and say, okay, well then everything I was doing was more for you. I'm learning. Mm -hmm. I'm on a healing journey too. Let's like slow it all down. Let's slow. I mean, slow sex is probably some of my top tips is to say like, go five times slower than you already do. We rush right to penetration. And here's the other thing is that sex has been for so long centered on penetration. Penis goes into vagina and that's sex. Yeah. But the truth is for the majority of women, we're not going to have orgasms through a penis. Mm -hmm. We're going to have orgasms through foreplay, oral sex, touching of vibrators. In fact, the ways that we are more likely to orgasm is through a mouth, through fingers, or through a toy. I was reading about this. 75% of women receive orgasms through, like, what oral, you were saying. Yeah, yeah. oral not touching, penetration. not penetration. So you see why sex is fraught, that if sex is penetration and you rush right to sex performatively, like maybe you we make out for a minute, you touch my boobs, then all of a sudden you're inside me and I'm like, we go back to being the slow cookers. Mm. I'm not even turned on. I'm not aroused. I didn't even. So that's why we got to slow everything down. Like wake, wake ourselves up touching oral sex. Like then we're ready. Then yeah. maybe penetration will feel better. But even then just only 75% of women are not going to have orgasms that way. So it's like really like a, like reimagining and kind of just starting from the ground up again, learning about sex. Yeah, and I think it's not very common for partners to have 40-minute sessions because it's like that's the time length for women to achieve orgasm. I don't know, but for me it's like... Yeah, I mean, I've had guys get get impatient. Like, you know, if if I haven't orgasmed, you know, 10 minutes in, they're like, baby, are you going to come? And it's like 10 minutes, yeah. Not yet. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Like, <laughs> right, exactly. Down. And some women do really quickly yeah. and some yeah. women take, and when I say 40 minutes, that's, it could be 20. Yeah. But usually it's not going to be just from penetration. It's going to be mm, yes. because we were like warming you up. We we're using toys, our mouth, other things. Mm-hmm. Or maybe I often say foreplay starts after the last orgasm. Have you been sending flirty texts? Did mm. you maybe make out in the morning before? And then that night you, you know, you, all day long it's building, like you're building your arousal. So mm. Making you know, out is so underrated. I know. Oh, and it's the first thing that goes in long-term she relationships. Yeah. So mm. maybe like a longer makeout session would also decrease the amount of time it would take you to get to orgasm because 100%. they're all related, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they yeah. all build on each other. But when we just sort of skate over all of this stuff, we stop kissing, we stop undressing slowly, we stop with foreplay, well, then we're just left with penetration and that's, you know, less I, satisfying. I want to go back to that because... Coming into a fresh and new relationship and you're really attracted to your partner and I think like all of us can say like we have sex nonstop and like maybe three times a day and then you kind of go through this phase after four months where you're like it dwindles off a little bit and then you kind of have it like twice a week, three times a week and then like after a year when that hot phase is over, like how do we keep the spicy hot sex in longevity in our relationships? That's a million dollar question. Mm. So every, I want to normalize the fact that every couple is going to go through the honeymoon phase. Mm -hmm. You just are, you're going to go through that period where that's why we're together because of that exciting newness. And the honeymoon phase usually lasts or like new relationship energy, as they call it, NRE, probably six months to two years. Because when we're new, when we're with a partner, what's happening is it's like everything is, novel and spontaneous and exciting. And so we get all those feel good hormones. It's like the most delicious cocktail of like dopamine and serotonin and, you know, just all of these things are firing. We literally, they, they've looked at the brainwave patterns of people falling in love or falling in lust and um, people on drugs, people on cocaine, mm-hmm. and their brains are exactly the same. So you're literally addicted to you're the high. new camp, the high. Oh, that makes high. so much you sense. You are high. <laughs> you are high on hormones. Okay. And so, then much yeah. <laughs> so much fun. So much fun. Let's yeah. get married. Let's have a kid. Yeah. Let's build our life together. Yeah. And then, like every high, no, it comes down. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I know. It's a bummer. <laughs> I love the new relationship. Yeah, it's the best thing ever. Is. And then we're but then we're always chasing that high. Yeah. Mm. So that's when we have to be like, okay, let me normalize the fact that that got us together and that's exciting and we know that we can have that. But now let's talk about where we are 
today. We still love each other. We're still attracted to each other. So let's try to come up with, let's figure out new ways that will get us, you know, turned on and in the mood and connected. And so it starts with talking about sex, truly, and finding, mm -hmm. well, what, what is our arousals? What's our fantasies or the things we want to try? Sometimes it's just trying something new because at the beginning, the why it's so hot is I've never seen this person naked. We've never done this thing before. It's so exciting. But after a few years, like we've done it all, we've seen it all. Mm. And so thinking about what else can we try? Maybe it's buying a sex toy or a new bottle of lube or a different position or making time for, you know, a vacation or just a night away. All of these novel things are going to help stoke that. But even just great conversations about sex, I'm telling you, once we get past the awkwardness and the shame or the embarrassment of talking about sex, it becomes really comfortable. Like you're literally talking about the weather. Mm -hmm. Like I said, in my, I think mm -hmm. I said in my master class, like it's sunny with a chance of orgasm. I like love really, that. You can be like, mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it, because it's true. Like you, it just becomes like, when are we, like my, my partner, we talk about it. He's like, when are we going to have sex? Scheduling sex. When is do it you a believe good in time? scheduling sex? I do. Yes, you mentioned That's taboo that. for some yeah. people. They're like, it's just weird now. If we schedule sex, it's just gonna be like now. It's like lost the the magic, I guess, because it's like you're. It's weird. Like you're yeah. like like going into work and then sitting down at the desk and like exactly. opening your laptop. So they'd be like, where's the. Oomph Where's around the oomph? It? Okay, yeah, and that's why for so long I was like, oh god, that sounds really awful. But what what you find with that is. Most couples are dealing with the opposite of scheduling sex, and that is in every relationship there is a high desire partner and a low desire partner. Okay, mm -hmm. that's that's how it happens, and so there's always one partner who wants sex all the time, mm -hmm. and they're the ones who's always making the bid for sex, and then there's the other partner who doesn't want it. So they have this dynamic in their relationship for many couples where someone's feeling rejected and someone's feeling guilty, and then the sex isn't really, and then and then. Monday night, you get into bed, you're like, God, I hope they don't want sex. I want to fake sleep. And then Tuesday night and then Wednesday night. But if you know, conversely, that you've scheduled that, you you know, it doesn't have to be Saturday night is our night that yeah. it's going to happen. Yeah. Well, then you don't have all this guilt and this like dynamic where someone's chasing and someone's rejecting. And then not only that, you know that it's happening Saturday. Maybe you'll get an impromptu sex on Tuesday. But on Saturday, then you both can look forward to that sex mm. and you can get ready for that sex meaning like what are we going to try what am I going to wear I'm going to shave I'm going to get myself turned on going back to solo sex like what what would actually feel good what can yeah. I kind of play with it play with it so then that's building your arousal because our, our brain is the largest sex organ mm. and so if we can get our brain on board for sex that's half more than half the battle and so knowing that it's happening then can really help couples to say uh, like you know. Wow. You mentioned the brain is the largest, largest sex organ. I'm so glad you said that because I want to talk about orgasms. I think that is something else. Orgasms are something else that are misunderstood. There's so many different types of orgasms, aren't there? And I think we're all expecting this big explosion, but it doesn't present like that for some people. No, it doesn't. It's all so... The way we orgasm is so different and there's such a focus on orgasm that it tends to... You know, because sex is really about connection and intimacy. I mean, orgasms are great. They're the icing on the cake. But yeah, going, I mean, it's its important, but it's so elusive, especially for so many women. I mean, think about it. The reason why we know so much about male sexuality and male orgasm and male masturbation is because it's been glorified. Mm. But female masturbation and female orgasm is like terrible PR. But like for men, you're like, yeah, we know it's because it's external. Their mm. penis external. It's a lot easier for you them to orgasm. You can see what's going on. I know what's going on. Yeah. We can touch ourselves. It's so easy. But for women, it's like we're like this Rubik's Cube. Mm. Every woman is different. We we have to figure out. I mean, honestly, the best way to have more orgasms is to give ourselves orgasms. Wow. Is to actually take the time to figure out what do I like. And I and. Again, one of the reasons why I started this is because I had been having sex. I had had partners, but I wasn't having orgasms because I was just focused on penetration. And mm. that wasn't the magic for me. I needed to figure out other things. So so the orgasm thing, there's so many different kinds. And we could break it down if you want for women. Yes. yes. Yeah. Please. Because okay. it's like everyone's like, what is an orgasm? Like people come, but it's like so, it's more like euphoric. Yeah. Like a, yeah. a high, intense. An yes. orgasm, yeah. if you think about it this way, is like the most like delicious muscle spasm mm -hmm. we can have. Like it's really a muscle spasm. It is our pelvic floor um, and our 
you know, getting aroused through our pelvic floor, and then we have like a muscle spasm and an orgasm. It's a re- it's like this euphoric release. But how do we get there? So for women, we can talk about like the clitoral orgasm, right? So that's the most that's the most common orgasm that if women have had an orgasm, they probably had a clitoral orgasm, and that is the clitoris, which is is also very misunderstood. But luckily, it's been studied a lot lately. So when I was writing my book, or for all the years I've been doing this, I always said the clitoris has 8,000 nerve endings. That's what we all believed, all sex educators, doctor, whatever, 8,000 nerve endings. Came to find out in the middle of writing my book that we finally are studying women's sexual health, and the clitoris has 12,000 nerve endings. Wow. Wow. To give you an example, comparison, the penis, a circumcised penis has 4,000 nerve endings. So a lot of the clitoris is that people know it is that external bud above the vaginal opening, but really that's just part of it. The clitoris actually has legs that extends deep inside of us, behind in, internal clitoral legs. And so when we hear about the G-spot and internal orgasms, it's coming from stimulation of those nerve endings. Now, a lot of them are towards the front of the vaginal wall. Okay. Um, so, gosh, I wish I brought my vulva puppet. I usually have a vulva puppet. <laughs> I really do. I'm like, uh, for I anyone draw watching. for you. I could draw. But if people but want to check this out later, you've probably got videos in line. Everything. This, right? yeah. yeah. Go okay, to sexemily.com, all my social media, sex yeah. with Emily. You can see my vulva puppet that I hold up. But I just want people <laughs> to understand that, like, like, so we've got the labia here and yeah. the clitoris, but then behind, right? So we've got, so if the clitoris is just, if you rub externally, that can help. If you rub the labia, the lips of the vagina, of the vulva. Remember, the vulva is the external part of the vagina. The vagina mm-hmm. is all internal, and the vulva is external. Mm-hmm. The vulva is analogous to the penis, not the vagina. So anyway, that's just a whole other okay. thing. Again, because we haven't studied women's sexual health. And so so for many women, they might have had a clitoral orgasm, even young. Like There's all these women who are like, oh, well, I was five years old, and I was riding a bike, or I was riding a horse, or I was in the shower, and I felt this sensation. Or maybe you just started to rub yourself against a pillow, mm. and you felt that. Like That's usually clitoral, and that's more of a, um, that can feel amazing. And that's, yeah, that's kind of the most common orgasm. Now, an internal orgasm is when we get into stimulating all of those internal clitoral nerves. Mm. Now, those are towards the front wall of the vagina. This is also why penetrative sex isn't going to hit it for women because you're going back. You're going back into the vaginal canal. Now, in my book, I write about the A spot and different kinds of orgasms, but I feel like when I want to cover this stuff first because this is more like where most women are. Mm -hmm. Like, that's where most women live. Like, A spot and C spot orgasms, cervical orgasms are fantastic, but for most women, we are... We haven't even been in touch with all these nerve endings. We haven't awoken, awoken these nerve endings yet and these pleasure parts. So the clitoris can happen. The clitoral orgasm is great to happen with fingers or a toy. Um, and then the internal or the G-spot or the G area, is like, it, it helps to have a clitoral orgasm first. So again, oral sex for women is a great way to go. Oral sex, fingers, um, externally rubbing, using lube. Another thing is I'm a huge fan of lube. Mm-hmm. No matter what how wet you are, yeah. Um, lube gets a really bad rap too. So there have been studies by the Kinsey Institute in Indiana, which is the leading sex research institute in the world. Okay. When they added lube to any sexual situation, women were 80% more likely to orgasm. Oh, wow. So, yeah, it's amazing because the clitoris is not self-lubricating. We might get wet. But our wetness level, so this is all, uh, you guys can bring me back if you want. I'm yeah. like, I'm going to go off <laughs> on some things, but we'll go back to No, this. I'm glad you're talking about lube. This is a great conversation. Okay. Also a big fan. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, I like coconut oil. Oh, yeah. Coconut oil yeah. can work yeah. too. Yeah. Because people can work. be sensitive to different lubes. So yes. we'd love to know the options as well. I will. I will. Yeah. I'm going to be sending you guys a care package after Amazing. too. <laughs> um, so, so for lube, so here's the thing by why lube gets such a bad rap is because Women, again, we, we just have to talk about all the misinformation we get. Mm. Is that we should always, when we're turned on, we're going to be wet. And we're going to be wet enough to mm. sustain penetrative sex. The problem is our wetness level is not necessarily an indicator of our arousal. Meaning, I could be wet and turned on. I could be turned on and not wet. So it also fluctuates with our hormones and our cycle, our mm. menstrual cycle. So different times of month. Different times of the month, we might be more wet, mm. and other times of the month, we're not. The problem with that is when we go to have sex, it just might not be that time of month, that time, that week. 
So when we add a few drops of lubricant to our partner can put on our hands, we put on our hands just to kind of, you know, make sure that we have enough lubricant, it'll sustain any kind of activity and we will avoid having any, sustain any pressure or touch or penetration. It'll help lubricate it so we don't have tears. Mm -hmm. Because when we're, sometimes we're wet at the beginning, but we're not wet five minutes later. Yes. You know, that's when we get tears and infections and STIs and all these things, and then sex becomes uncomfortable. Yeah. So think of it like wearing sunblock on a cloudy day. Okay. You know that you can also get a sunburn yeah. when it's cloudy. Yep. You can get tears and you can, this is like a safety mechanism mm. for sex. So if you add a few drops of lube at the beginning of sex, then with all these nerve endings, your nerve endings love lube. They mm. love vibration too. That's why toys are great mm. because we want to stimulate them. We want to wake them up and they're living all around our pelvic floor area. But just from like a penis or a finger or maybe a mouth, like a mouth, that's why we love oral sex mm. because it's wetness. I see. Mm. With, it's like really just science or biology, right? Like understanding the physiology of our arousal mechanism. So these things are just really important. And Although I read, the other, I read the other day and I want you to yes. correct me if I'm wrong. Using saliva as lubrication isn't recommended. It's not recommended. Yeah. Oh. Because there could be bacteria yes. in it. It's not consistent. I mean, what if your partner just ate something or mm. there's just dirt and it's not. Yucky, yucky. But what, would, what do we see in porn? Oh, Spit, so, yeah. saliva. <laughs> I mean, you know, who can it's like, a kink, muster I guess. up that much? Yeah. It's a kink, right. And I'm yeah. not saying you're not going to like have a, a terrible disease if you're using saliva. Right. But my mission is like a lube on every nightstand. <sighs> yeah. Just I, do it. Use it. It could be coconut oil. Coconut oil is not great with um, toys. Yeah. And it's not great with condoms. But yeah, in a pinch you can use it. But don't also use the same one you're using for stir fry. Like we have to be very careful <laughs> no, about our a... vaginal microbiome. There's a lot of things that could d upset us. There's a lubricant company that I'm the chief sexologist of called Playground. And it's, I love it because it is all of the, it's like a facial for your vagina. It has like ashwagandha and black cohosh and all these ingredients that you know are going to be good and safe. Wow. And you won't get it, an infection. And yeah, it just plays nicely with no matter what your body part. I use a brand called Silk, which is I think made from kiwi fruit. Oh yeah. S yeah. Okay. I think it's sure S-Y-L-K. I think it's actually an Australian brand, but you can order it online. Okay. Um, and the other thing my OBGYN suggested is almond oil. Oh. Um, yeah. Don't know why. That's I, what she told me. I think that you can use the oils like almond oil and coconut oil. I just worry, like, what if it turns or what if you have a sensitivity to nuts? And <laughs> I don't know. I just yeah. I definitely really don't use it if you have grits. a sensitivity to nuts. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but what if you didn't know it? Yeah. I just think something that's made specifically. So I love And I have all these on my store. If you go to sexwithemily.com, we have a shop site that we just launched. And after 20 years, I was like, I just want to send people to the products and the, the accessory, sex accessories that I've used and that I know are going to mm. work for your body. I think there's also, um, going talking about the topic of lube, there's some shame, I think, around oh. lube. Mm. And I, I think even guys and girls, it's like, well, yeah, I want to use lube because I think it's fun. And it's going to be great for the, the session, like the experience. But also I think there's some shame or guys feel not good about themselves knowing that a woman is about to, uh, you know, s slap on some lube yeah. thinking like, oh, I don't get you wet or I'm not getting you aroused. Do, like we talk about that and yes. taking that away from like the I'm mental so health I'm so glad aspect. you brought that because that was actually, that's, that's the point. So there is so much shame around lube. How it used to be and probably how it still is for many people is that the guy feels like he's not doing enough. Maybe his people. His penis wasn't what you wanted it to be. And so because he, in his mind, he's responsible for your wetness. Mm. That's why I start out saying like, none of that is even a factor. It's all again, misinformation. And so we feel like, and women feel shame because they're like, why aren't I wet? Mm. What did I do wrong? And so people, it used to be like, let me get this old bottle of lube out from under the bed or like <laughs> in the back of the bathroom, you know, cupboard because we just don't want to have to use it. It's like an emergency thing. But what I'm saying is like, let's normalize that you should use it for any kind of sex. Mm. Masturbation with a partner every single time. Just to just to make sure that, well, we'll have more orgasms, it's safer. Mm -hmm. You're gonna know that you'll be, there'll be enough wetness. So I guess just arming people with facts, which is really what I try to lay down. Like 
I know all the misinformation out there that is rampant. And I've been fighting the, you know, fighting this battle around Lou for many, many years. And I think it's, now there's a lot of different Lou brands, which is great. Like it used to be, you know, brands you buy at the drugstore. And to be honest. Good old KY. That's not great for women. <laughs> yeah. no. Some, but it's not. But that's all yeah. we knew. And, and so now there's so many wonderful brands that are making lube with women's health in mind. But I'm telling you, it, it just in the last five years, this is all such new stuff that we're wow. talking about. Like it's that's why you guys are asking such great questions around it, because it's like people are thinking, yeah, but get lube. But what my, what's my partner going to say? Because I know that he or I feel weird about it. So like that's why the communication part is, hey, like talking about it ahead of time, maybe just saying I want you to know I got this beautiful bottle of lube today, you know, uh, and and what I heard is I learned that's actually, oh, and let me tell you the other part of the study is that men are more likely to orgasm with lube too. Yeah. Wow. So it's not just about women. It's about yeah. everybody. Men are so psyched. And I used to feel this way early on too when I was dating men and you know, I've been through so many different kinds of relationships since in the 20 years of my journey that I would have to be like, let me, let me just show you something. And I would just make it fun. I'd be like, I put some in my hand and this is just a great tip. I'd be like, feel this. And then I'd put my hand on their pants, I'd put it on them, and they'd be like, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> and then it was never an issue. Yep. It never came up again. Yeah. And they were like, I'm in. Let's They're bring that board. lube. Yep. Right? They're always in. Yeah. They <laughs> They're always in when they have information. They have yeah. the care package. It's just we, got, we have a lot, of, we have a lot to, to battle with right now. It's a lot I of feel taboo. no shame around lube whatsoever. <laughs> Good. I <laughs> because love it. Because in my head, I'm kind of like, doesn't matter how wet I am, how turned on, you know, we both are, whatever – that's friction. That will dry you out yeah, real quick. Exactly. Like, it, Penetration can give us so much. Yeah, it's, yeah, it dries us out. And then if we're performative, we don't want to stop. We don't want to say, ouch, or that yeah. hurts, or we're not even really in, in our body. We're not embodied. Mm -hmm. And so when we're not and we're like, then we, like, that's why sex hurts. That's why mm. we have so much pain. That There's a lot of reasons why sex can hurt, actually. But that's one reason that if we mm. can just prevent it by saying, like, let's just do some lube and let's reapply if we need to. Yeah. yeah. I like that. Um, back to the vagina. Yes. I want to I want to share a very personal experience that I had on here, uh, which I actually had no plans to share this whatsoever. Had but on this, here or just like no, well not <laughs> it's, I'm not having it right now, but um, I would like to share it yes. with you guys. Um, when I was in my very first relationship, and I'm a I'm a person that, you know, I had great parents, but I did have a lot of shame around sex, I think, growing up because when I was a teenager, my mother, and it came from the right place, was like, you know, don't sleep around like your friends. Um, you know, make sure that when you, you save your virginity for someone really special and, you know, because I don't want you to regret it and best of intentions, but probably wasn't great for me, to be honest. So I didn't end up losing my virginity until I was 19 years old. I was in my first relationship. Um, I was with the guy for four years and he told me he was great at sex. Um, <laughs> I look back now and I've learned a bit since then. But he told me, so I believed him at the right, time. And right, I was kind yeah. of following everything. He said he was very against lube and that kind of thing, which is why I'm such a big fan of it now. And I developed this, um, I mean, I was constantly experiencing pain with oh, sex wow. to the point where I stopped having sex. Did wasn't interested I think at one point I didn't have sex with him for like six months, poor yeah. guy. But I, d I wasn't courageous enough to have a conversation about it. I just was in pain, constantly complaining about it, which caused friction in the relationship. He wasn't really open to talking about it either. Um, in the end, I plucked up the courage, told my mother about it, and she took me to the doctor. Mm. And I was diagnosed with the condition... Uh, I think it's called vaginismus mm -hmm. or something yeah. where I had not wanted to have sex so much that I had, it, it's like weightlifting. I yeah. had developed this extremely strong muscle mm -hmm. in my vagina that just <laughs> did not want to let go because I just didn't want anything to enter, I guess. Oh, mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. And I actually had to treat that. And, you know, if this is you at home and you're experiencing pain and sex, I'm sharing this information because I hope it will help you. I actually had to retrain my vagina yes. through pelvic floor exercises, through dilators, which are literally like glass dildos. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I started with a small one and it got bigger and bigger. And, and as I learned to relax. Um, that's but, really common. I'm so glad you thank you for sharing that. That's because common. Yeah. Oh, it's really common. Wow. Much better business. now, by the way. But I had to work on it. To no, grow. but I, that, thank you for sharing that because that yeah. really is so common. So women, so what you're talking about is that you had developed, and maybe it was 
developed through sex with him, or maybe you always had this, like a lot of women walk around, we're talking about our pelvic floor muscles. So our pelvic floor muscles are those muscles that are responsible for orgasm. They're, they're kind of like, and if you want to locate these muscles, it's the, um, like the Kegel muscles or the, the, when you're peeing, for example, it's the muscle that stops and starts the flow of urine. Mm -hmm. So you can just, you know, take that muscle. So what happened with what you're saying is that you were clenching because you're like, mm. I want nothing to come in. You walk around clenching. Well, there's a lot of women who experience vaginismus. Maybe that's just their, um, like when they get stressed or they're in fight or flight, mm. they clench mm -hmm. and they don't even know they do it. Like maybe they've been doing it since they were six years old, but then they go to have sex or put a tampon in mm -hmm. and it's painful. Mm. So vaginismus is, and there's also vulvodynia. That's vulvodynia is the same thing, but it's when you have um, pain externally. Mm. But women experience because there's so many. Um, th these are strong muscles, and so you. What you're saying is that you had this pain, you didn't know what it was, and then you went to see a pelvic floor physical therapist or your doctor. That's what I recommend women to go, and they can help you. It really is something that women because I always say you don't have to live with pain with sex. Mm. So many women have pain, and they just think, well, I guess I gotta get my periods and give birth <laughs> and have painful sex. Yeah. Like that's just my lot in life. But you talked about the experience of having dilators, which are basically like glass or silicone. They look like penises or dildos mm -hmm. that you put inside of you, and then you gradually build up over time to larger and larger so you can relax the muscles. And then your muscles start to unwind around the dilators, and then you can kind of breathe and then have less pain-free sex. Yeah, something wow. else I did was uh, in the shower, uh, my OBGYN taught me to stretch it out. Like when you're in the shower, she's like, and you're in relaxed and it's like a conscious state. You can stick your fingers in there and stretch it out. Yeah. And that helped a lot Good. too. Okay. Like sort of like an internal massage. Yeah, exactly. Mm. You could yeah. play with it. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, that's why solo sex is so important to like know your body and actually take a mirror and look at what happens to your body when you get aroused, when you're turned on. Like you see that the whole area becomes engorged and swells like with blood mm. internally. So that's when like you, you can see when you get aroused and then you can see different body parts and you can see like your, um, you can actually see your, like we talked about earlier about like your G-spot or your, your female prostate as we call it. But when you have a clitoral orgasm and you're aroused or engorged, you can actually like bear down if you have a mirror and see the actual spots on your body, the areas that will give you pleasure. Mm. Uh, but that's, I mean, and putting your fingers inside, you know what feels normal and what doesn't. And but 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 this goes back to shame is that women just we don't like men are like walking around with their hands on their pants and touching it and masturbation. But with women, we're like, I don't want to look, I don't want to know, it's a I flower. don't like my body. Don't yeah, it. it's exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's a flower, it's, it's something, you know, and there is some women who have shame around it, but once we get familiar with it, and even as horrifying as that might sound for some women to look at it, it's like, but that is your sexual organ, that's part of yourself. Getting familiar with that and getting comfortable with that is gonna help you have more pleasure in your life. Mm. So I'm mean, actually so glad I went through that experience because I, I was forced to, I was at really a young forced age to, to meet it, you know, and actually yeah. and face this thing head on. And I did learn a hell of a lot about my body mm. through that experience. Yeah, I mean, that's 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 a really, thank you for, I mean, really, thank you for sharing that because that is so common and many women don't talk about it or they don't get help for it. Um, so, yeah. Talking about um, the changing dynamics of vagina, um, getting pregnant. I just had a baby not too long ago and... I don't know that there's like some taboo or there's like some feelings around when a woman gets pregnant. Some people, some women get super aroused and horny for like months on ends and some just like don't touch me. But then it's also on the other end where some men are open to having sex with their pregnant partner. Yeah. Some men love it. But some men are like, I will not touch you. I'm going to hit the baby when I'm in spite of you. Misinformation. <laughs> I know. On the head. Yeah. Can we talk about that? Yeah. And then also after what happens to like, even for me, there was a insecurity about, is my vagina going to change? Yeah. And will I be loose like after and will like, will my partner en enjoy having sex with me? It's terrible. Yeah, but we'll no, talk but about these that. are all, yeah, we can talk about all of this because again, there's just misinformation and we don't talk about it. So, yeah. so here's the other thing. It's all like bio individuality is how I like to think about our sexual desires and arousal. It's that it's, it's every woman. It's different. Like are some women, 
you know, they get pregnant and they say like, the third trimester, they're really turned on, want sex more. The second, like, it's different for every woman. They're like, I got really, hor you know, horny. I was aroused for like my first trimester. <laughs> Our first trimester, I, I, was, it was, I don't know. I was like, my partner was like, you're the horniest pregnant lady. <laughs> I don't know. And he was like, I wasn't dealt with it. He was like, well, yeah. you know, stay back. <laughs> Has to put me in a cage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, like, and then, then, then that's amazing. And then some women don't get that though. They're like, yeah. I thought I was going to be really aroused and turned on because like I said, it's all our own individual experiences that contribute to our arousal. It could be, there's a lot of different reasons why certain women get more turned on and others don't. And actually smart sex in my book is all about the five pillars of sexual intelligence. And there's five things to look at when it comes to sex. We don't get, but like your hormones is one, how often you move, are you on a medications, the food you eat, your upbringing, shame, how you, well, you communicate. There's a lot of things, but going back to this is, so yeah, you had that experience. And then, yeah, that's really common that men are like, I don't want to hurt the baby. But if we could just arm people with accurate information, like you're not gonna hurt the baby. Like that's not gonna happen. <laughs> Are you and sure? I'm yeah. sure. Okay. Yes. Now it depends. You heard there, it first. There's baby's some, fine. Baby's fine. Yeah, baby's fine. Now, if you are in the third trimester and you are like late and you know, there are some doctors who say, like, have sex, like get the baby out. It's true. But when you're first, you know, the first trimester, second trimester, you don't have to worry about that. Now you could also talk to your doctor about it. hopefully you're with a doctor. I mean, the problem is doctors. Not all doctors are. That's not, I shouldn't say that. Most doctors say no. That's 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 not a risk. Mm. But I'm just saying. I'm I'm thinking more about women's sexual health when it comes to pregnancies. Like, if you go to other countries, like in France, when you give birth to a baby, they don't just like wrap. They don't just give you information about the baby, but no. they give you information about your vagina, they and do. they send you home with a pelvic floor exercising they machine. They really do take care of your vagina. They I was do, talking but about here this they're with like my makeup artists that I work with in France and it's like you know with with birth it's common like women tear and you know do things and they're kind of like you're kind of like well what do I do with it and they're like well just take care of yourself that's mm. what happens here that's in America a, yeah. and then in like France nice they're like life. they check in with you they teach you like exercises how to like and keep it moist what are all these different things the factors of health is very different from like after birth culture France or like yeah. Europe, excuse in Europe, me. then here, yeah, then yeah, here. yeah. We just um, so yeah. You but having sex with your partner when you're pregnant can be a really like beautiful connecting thing. And so I think again, going back to like guess getting data, and I think your gynecologist probably told him that it was okay to have sex. Uh, yeah, usually, and even like right near the end, sometimes if the baby's late, and usually in first pregnancy, the baby doesn't want to come. They and I wanted to. Have, you know, bring the baby on naturally. Didn't I didn't have to do this, but they're like, yep, the doctor will be like, might send you home to go and have sex. Have sex, right. Yeah. 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 But that and so that's good. But but early on, no, you're not gonna hit the baby, you're not gonna disrupt it. I mean, yeah, couples some couples have like amazing sex during pregnancy. So it's just but yeah. I would say yeah, so for your next baby, you guys are fine. You're safe. You're good to We're have good. sex. And what but about aftermath? After. Is it the idea that the vagina is just like this open Hole and that men are not going to enjoy being with a woman that's had children. Uh, no, I mean, I sure, I, I, I don't think that that's true. I mean, I know that's not true. That yeah. is a myth, and our bodies go back to you know pretty much how it was. Although there are some tearing, and our pelvic floor muscles aren't as strong. You know those sneezing and pee muscles, like when you, you know, yeah, that's what we, you get urinary incontinence, as we call it, mm. after childbirth that can happen. So we really just have to do the work of strengthening our pelvic floor. That could be one thing that helps. Um, and for some women, they don't, like they're like, oh, I do Pilates or I move around, I didn't have that. But again, that's why every single woman is different. But there's so many great things you can do. There's Kegel exercisers, there's like silicone toys that look like little weights, like little barbells you can put in your vagina and walk around in them. Those will naturally strengthen your pelvic floor. Wait, really? They, yeah. Wow. They're, Hang on, I did see something uh, on Instagram uh, where, this woman, I think, I think she's a, she's a, she's in the sexual wellness space, and she put like this crystal thing in her vagina, and it was attached to, there was something thing. hanging off the end of it, like a, a weight or something, and she'd like walk around and like. Oh, I know what you're talking about. She's intense. I know. <laughs> she she's an intense lady. She carries like weights by yes! every day. I know. With her vagina. So she's like, I know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But this yeah. is not, that's like years of training. She can like, has pictures of her like in the middle of a street with like things hanging for like a weight. Yes. Wait, what? I'm not, she's in public. Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah. that's oh. not what we're talking about. Although, yeah. well, but the point of that is that 
we can strengthen our muscles and why it's really important to have to be in touch with our pelvic floor, whether it's because even as you get older, your vagina like can tilt and atrophy over time, which is a terrible word, but it just gets God. loose like everything. <laughs> it does have everything. Guys, drops. pay attention to your vagina. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. And yeah. so, so the weights are cool. There's a brand that I love. My uh, Jeju makes these like ami these kegel balls that you just they come in different weight sizes. And what I would do, I'd wear them, and I was like testing them out because I've tested everything. I would wear them when I, I remember I'd wear them to spinning class. Or I'd wear them when I go on a hike because you're you're naturally doing your you're naturally tensing your pelvic floor to keep them inside while you're walking and moving around. So you're naturally, but then you don't have to sit and like do kegels. There's also like handheld devices, like the ones I was talking about that they give you in Europe. Um, there's one that is called the, um, oh, what's the name of it? But basically these devices that uses electromagnetic stimulation. So it, it's like a TENS device almost. They have these little magnetic um, things on the side of it. So when you put it inside of you, it gives you like these little, like little shocks. Um, Wow. But you can't, but it doesn't hurt. Oh. And it's stimulating blood flow mm -hmm. and it's stimulating and strengthening the muscles at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so you are strengthening your pelvic floor by doing this. Maybe you put, so they have, it looks like a little egg that you put inside of you. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think and I've seen it. You've seen those. Yeah. Because I want to find the yeah. name of it. <laughs> well, the next thing I want to ask you is about sex toys and what your favorites okay. are. Oh I want God. the hot list. Let's do it. I'll tell you everything. <laughs> 100% I'm going to be going shopping for Valentine's Day the for pleasure myself. Chest. <laughs> you guys, there are so many good ones, so I'll get to it. I just feel like I love it. Well, What's the we'll one? What's the one? Oh, it's <laughs> Talk to there's me. There's one where there's one you put on your clitoris and then one that goes inside and then also your partner can have intercourse with you while oh, the it's Wee on your clitoris. Oh, the, the Wee, Wee Vibe. Vibe. Yeah. Yes, I love Wee Vibe. So Wee Vibe is a wonderful toy. They have a couple's toy. And so what you're talking about, it's like a C-shape yes. that you wear inside of you, meaning it like it's stimulating your internal clitoral nerves and your yeah. clitoris, and then the penis so can still go inside of you while you're wearing it. So Sounds let's like see, that. it's going around you. <laughs> so yeah, that's called the Wee Vibe. That's a couple's toy. Like many, there's other brands that make it now, but the Wee Vibe was the original. Yeah, the OG, the purple the one. OG, exactly. The OG and purple. It actually comes with a um, like a remote. Now you could use it. Yep. You could use your phone to control. Yeah, it. they can. You know, partner can also just go. Doo, doo, oh yeah, doo, I've doo, seen doo. those ads yeah. on Instagram on the meme accounts, like of you know the the guy standing there with his phone and the girls must be wearing it. She's standing in the kitchen in her little hot pants and he goes on the screen she goes <laughs> that looks like fun it's actually 50 it's shades fun. of grey well yeah. that's really fun too you guys there's a new one speaking of like what what would be hot right now like there's the um, so a brand called Oh My Bod they were like one of the first that synced up vibrators with music oh and wow so this was like literally in 2006 they made the first Oh My Bod that synced up to your iPod at the time and you could play music and the the toy vibrates to that music. Avicii. So t -t 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 -t. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was going to say, I hate hard house, yeah. but like maybe that would work well for exactly this. Exactly, <laughs> right. No, it would, right? Yeah. You could go, and it also will pick up. Now it's so advanced. They have amazing toys, but they have this new panty vibe. And it basically you wear it in your underwear. It has a little magnetic, you know, thing so it stays in place. It just looks like, you know, like it's like, it looks like a flat egg. Mm-hmm. Kind of like a panty liner, but it's a vibrator, and you put it inside, and then you can use their app to control it. So you could be on date night, and your partner can be controlling it. You could wear it to work. You could control it yourself. Mm -hmm. Or it just works like a regular vibrator. But that's just a fun, when we talk about spicing it up, like that's yeah. a really fun way to play. It's a great gift to buy for your partner mm -hmm. because it's like, let's just w play with this panty vibe tonight. I'm so just that's getting really a fun. visual of someone in their yeah. office cubicle with their. <laughs> Just, you know, really boring, like, brown <laughs> surroundings. And they're just sitting there tapping away at their computer. And <laughs> 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 but how fun. But there are some couples that are into that, like, power they play. Are, like, yeah. I'm going to be the one that, you know, controls your orgasm. Or I'm going to, yeah, get that you really That could go horribly wrong in a meeting. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Horribly wrong I had someone meeting. that wanted to do it. Could be fun for a party. party. Oh, really? I think also because, you know, if you have long distance as well. It's great that's fun. So maybe, like, something to have more connection. And yeah. also, like... You know, instead of like the casual like phone sex or whatever yeah, it is, it's like you're on, you know, there'll be. I'm you telling know, you, one's in LA, one's in Paris, and yeah. you're like, I just had sex with my partner, but we were in a different country. Yeah. Very <laughs> That's cool. why I love remote control <laughs> vibrators. They, a lot of them um, make them. Wevibe makes a ton of them. Oh my God. A lot of companies make them now too. 
But that's the fun thing is that they also come with these apps that you can launch and you can like, it's kind of like a FaceTime, but it's in the app. So your partner could have like a penis ring mm-hmm. around them or cock ring as they call it, or you could have a toy and they're controlling yours. Your, you could watch each other or you could just do it virtually. Like, you know, someone however could be around the world, however you do it. Play huh? sort of a game of roulette and like, you don't know what time I'm going to give you an orgasm. Exactly. That's yeah. the fun part though. Yeah. You're yeah. like, I'm in control of this. I'm just going to give you a little buzz, let you know I'm thinking about you, you know? S- talking about spicing it up um, after years in relationships and I think maybe maybe this is common threesomes and I don't know if I feel like a lot of women even for myself I don't want to bring someone else I'm like you're mine I'm not willing to share you I think I will scratch the girl's eyes out or whoever it is (laughs) don't you touch him I don't want that (laughs) like I want to do that what are your thoughts of like with working with clients or people like has it been helpful do you do you think it's helpful in relationships to have threesomes or you know over time does it create trust over time I don't know by having that that other person because men love threesomes I think they really do yeah some do do as well it just depends top fantasy for many for men and for women yeah so it's a case-by-case basis now it's not for everybody like I would say that the majority (laughs) of the people have your reaction like if I saw my partner with someone else in the bedroom I would scratch their eyes out I'd be so jealous (laughs) how the hell does this even happen right how uh, why would I don't know maybe in time it might change but for now it could change I've never had one either and never wanted to but you never know yeah you know life is long maybe you're married 25 years and you know you and your, your husband are so comfortable with each other you're like I'm like let's let's try this yeah no <laughs> someone's like, told me one of my like gay friends was like oh you just wait and see once you've been married for how many years you know it's, yeah, you'll, you'll be down you'll be, you'll be down and i'm like for now no yeah yeah no, i mean down. for some <laughs> couples healthy couples i mean here's the thing about threesomes it's so fraught it's such a common question you don't want to have a threesome if your partner your partner's pressuring you we should have a threesome we should have a threesome and this is, would be performative right mm-hmm. like oh yeah i guess he wants it so i'm going to do it i mean that's a disaster that's mm-hmm. definitely happened to both of yeah. us yeah 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 mm-hmm. i'm sure right couples pressure you You're oh, like, I, oh hate I want it. to be a good lover oh yeah I, fight about it yeah fight yeah. i yeah. was yeah like i was disgusted actually mm-hmm. i despised him because it's like it, yeah it hurt actually because then it, you put the shame in yourself you're like well am i why yeah. am i not just good enough for you yep yeah exactly so that's also, where our this minds guy wants go to, to cheat on me like, yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah exactly mm-hmm. but basically when our partner's like we should have a threesome the first thing we think is like you're not into me anymore mm-hmm. do you want to sleep with my best friend like where is this coming yeah. from and that's like, the really unhealthy way like that's the to go about a threesome is to like pressure your partner or to just not you know, have more information around it and to make it this, um, yeah, this like, can, this, uh, I guess a threat in the relationship too. Like if we don't have a threesome, and I think a lot of us have been there, mm. but couples who successfully have threesomes are couples who really talk about it a lot beforehand. Like what is it in a threesome that you, you want? Like what, mm. like tell me more about what about a threesome is hot for you? Like, why do you want to have that? Now, maybe your partner might say, I guess I'm talking about two women in a male threesome because I think that's probably what we're asking about. Like, what if your partner was like, I just think it would be so hot to see you with another woman. Like, that would be a really big turn on for me. Is that something you'd be into? It's and so rare women be like, what if I want another man? They'd yeah, be like, whoa, whoa, <laughs> well, crazy that's it, but why not? <laughs> <laughs> but equal the man's oppor- like, no, no, I don't want to have a threesome anymore. <laughs> exactly. Well, equal opportunity, but why yeah. not, right? Maybe yeah. that would be hot for yeah. you. So yeah. maybe we'll start with my guy. We'll start with my kind of threesome <laughs> yeah. and let's see how your threesome app yeah. goes along, yeah. right? So so if you could get to the point where it's like, I think that would be hot or I know that, you know, because there are a lot of women who want to experiment, but they haven't before. And so kind of, having a dialogue around it and thinking like, okay, well maybe that would be the the way to have it if we both are on the same page. And then I tell couples to really like dirty talk it, role play it, watch porn with threesomes. Maybe next time you're like, having sex, be like right now I'm picturing this thing happen. Like you really have to workshop it, but, and you have to be on board with it. And maybe it is with a man. Maybe you, that is why you're like, oh, we have a man. You're not even no, a man, have a man. man. <laughs> I'm like, just not doing it. <laughs> right. Maybe well, an okay. AI, maybe a robot. Yeah, exactly. Maybe. <laughs> Let's start with a robot. Oh, virtual. <laughs> doesn't people have virtual sex yeah. now? Yeah, like, they do. Or even get married to the sexual dolls, uh, that, you know? They do. Yeah. yeah. I was at a sex toy trade show yesterday. So <laughs> there's like I bet you saw dolls. some shit. Oh my yeah. God. Yeah, you're like, is that a person? Is that a thing? <laughs> Hello? Yeah, eventually everyone will be having 
threesome with their robot. That's yeah. kind of cool. Maybe I'd do that. It's safer, right? You're like, yeah. well, let's start yeah. with this doll. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's just part of the whole. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, look, meet Natasha. Yeah. She's our new friend. But yeah, that's that's a way to do it. But I think it's just I think it's just because we want variety, baby. We want to try something different. And so, but the way we go about having threesomes, yeah, it can be fr- like, so really got to get beneath it. Like, what is it about a threesome that would be hot? Could we role play it? Is there other things that could satisfy this need? But it's certainly not for anyone, but couples who have it. I'm telling you, I hear from, you know, my podcast, I've talked to millions of people over the years and I probably talked to tens of thousands of people because it's a call and show <laughs> is that there are couples that have been together 20 years that are really healthy and every once in a while they have threesomes or they're in a throuple or they have one common partner and those are the couples who are really entrenched in each other's pleasure mm. they know each other's bodies they feel safe i mean the thing about a threesome is that you want to feel like we are good like yes. no matter who comes in here it's about us i love you you love me look like, we're, we're solid we're connected and this person is somebody that we're just going to experiment with. Maybe we don't even know the real name. Maybe we're in Vegas. It's definitely not a friend. Like, you have to set a lot of boundaries mm. and a lot of rules and a lot of, you know, yeah, round boundaries, rules, and discussions around threesomes before you actually have them. So the couples who are successful have learned to navigate around that and really talked about what could the roadblocks be, the pitfalls, what could go wrong, and they only do it. You know, at play parties or with people they yeah. don't know or, you know. I didn't just... know there was rules. to. I did. Now I know. But, like, when I was younger, I didn't know. Like, I thought threesome was like, okay, like, another woman, man, whatever, it comes in and it's like, you're just having sex with them and you're joining in. But I didn't realize. I had a friend who was like, no, there's the ru- there can be rules to it. Like, you can talk to your partner saying, I don't want you to penetrate her. Yes. She can only give you oral and, oh, and then girl on girl and that's it. That's or sometimes, it. like, they say, like, and how you can watch and what and I was like wow there's rules to there's this there's so many rules there's so in many fact rules. if you want to do it effectively and healthy in a healthy way that's going to enhance your relationship you absolutely need to have rules mm. and there are and sometimes we readjust those rules we're like okay well it actually might have been okay if you you know made out with her or but yeah some common rules that we put in place or boundaries are like no penetration no making out no sleepovers no cuddling. <laughs> no sleepers. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, time Get out. Out. Oh, looks time like your Uber's here. It yeah. reminds me of that uh, Sex in the City episode where uh, Samantha is with her partner and the girl's just sticking around and she's like pushing her off the bed and she keeps rolling off the bed and she just. <laughs> It's the funniest. I don't know if you've seen it, but yeah, and she just keeps exiting. She's like, oh, yeah, I give up. That's like, yeah, I wouldn't be able to do it. Um, I want to talk about porn again. Okay. And I think. Are you going to ask the question? I was about to say, speaking of girl and girl. Speaking of girl and girl. Why don't you ask the question? Because I feel like I get good at it. Shanina and I, (laughs) in our friendship group, um, at ran a little bit of a survey. Oh, cool. <laughs> I love it. I love that. juicy. To do with porn, um, which which upset a couple of the men in the group. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> basically uh, asked the question of the women, you know, do you prefer um, heterosexual porn? And these are all heterose- heterosexual women. And I would say women that are not generally into other women. Do you prefer heterosexual porn over lesbian porn? And the answer was that 100% of the girls, except one that was probably lying, said mm-hmm. lesbian porn. Yeah. yeah. And we did a survey outside of that friend group and <laughs> every one of them said girl on girl. Yeah, really common. Really common. Do you common. think that's yeah. true? Uh, yeah, And I why? Do. Well, there's a few theories why, and again, it's different for everybody, is because women, it's, women, it's familiar. It's women... It's like familiar parts. So it's like, oh, I know what she's doing there. And that's like, and women's bodies, it's beautiful, I think, to watch women. Mm. And we know the parts. Somehow it feels safer. And I also think that women know how to please other women. Yeah. Yeah. So perhaps we're watching it and we're thinking. We know what the G spot is. The yeah, clitoris. A lo- they I don't know think it. a lot of men know where the yeah, they clitoris don't, is. They don't know where it is. Yeah. They don't know any of it. But if you, if I have the part and, and we're having sex, like we know what to do to each other. So it's actually... I think that's why we're like, oh, that's actually I mean, what actually would be a great message to give get back to your your male partners is like, that's hot because they know what to do. Like that looks like that would be hot for me. Like mm. I want that kind of attention to my body. Mm-hmm. And so I think there's a lot we can learn from watching, you know, two women together having sex because since we've already covered that, we don't have a lot of information about 
female sexuality and arousal and what feels good to her. We don't naturally doesn't we don't come by that information naturally. Hmm. Um, is that understanding that like we we have these desires and our bodies work in certain ways and, and all the sex that you've been seeing of the penetration all that isn't necessarily working for us. I mean, you guys tell me so when you're watching it, this porn, like what's going on usually? Like probably oral sex yeah. or kissing or nipple play like touching touching yeah. yes yeah. i think also the idea was the guys were having an idea is like you watch lesbian porn you're gay and i'm like no no the mm -mm. kind of porn you watch does not define your um even for sexuality. males it, what if nope. males watch gay porn no nope. it's common men do watch yeah. gay porn yeah. doesn't mean yeah. that they're gay this is the other I these are the other they go they yeah. probably wouldn't Some, admit to it yeah they won't i don't, really, I don't think they would admit yeah. it yep no and a lot of women like watching gay porn too yeah i haven't I haven't really dabbled into that um, could be male your next gay thing. Oh, I, I've watched a lot of different types of porn. I'm going to be honest. Good. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I like porn. No, yeah, yeah, of course. You have to know. Like, it's, yeah. I think it's 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 smart because you have to know what you like and what you don't like. And like, oh, like maybe you want to try that and experience it. It's just kinky. So, it's fun. Yeah. It's yeah. variety again. It's yeah. something different. It's something new. It's like, and you could also learn some from porn. I mean, don't learn like how you should be moaning or arching your back, but you could learn different positions, but I think by watching two women together, it's probably could also give you ideas of mm -hmm. what, like a great way porn could be used is to be like, I just watched this this porn, babe. Like, like let's watch it together. Mm -hmm. That's really hot for me. So like, yeah. could you do that to me? Could wow. we try that? Yeah. So I think that, yeah, I mean, that's, that's probably one of the reasons. And um, I don't think it's necessary that a lot of women want to be, but no, some women do want to be with other women too. Mm -hmm. I think that could inspire them. But I think that what we're finding is that sexuality is, we're being hopefully much more open yeah. that our sexuality changes over our lifetime and we're constantly learning and growing. And maybe you might find one day that that would be something you want to try. But it doesn't mean like you want to be in a relationship with a woman per se. Maybe yeah. you just want to try it out. Mm -hmm. I mean, I like to look at sex as like an experience. It's about our pleasure. It's about our arousal. Like it's a really important part of our overall sexual health is our sexuality. And so maybe watching porn is enough. But maybe some women, they're like, I'd love to experience. with the, I'd love to have that experience. But, you know, and I think that there's lot more places we can go and we're a lot more open to that now that you can maybe find that i think anything's possible right now yeah I the heard recently social. i heard recently that there is porn specifically for women made by women yes so um there are a few great sites now that do that um Belessa is one of them make love not porn is another one um erica lust these are women who have companies that is made by women for women so what i mean by that is you see all different body types Mm -hmm. There's a lot of focus on women's pleasure, obviously, but there's also men in these films, but mm. it's more about oral sex, using toys, all the things that I'm kind of talking about. And usually in this porn, there's a plot. You're like, I don't want to just see her sleeping with her ski instructor. I want to see how they met. <laughs> Oh Does wow! She really there's like a backstory. Like, there's a backstory. Wait, this is cool. I kind of want. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just interested. Shanita, like what are we young doing? And, young and the Restless <laughs> yeah, is exactly. a bit of a, yeah. a drama to it. Yeah, yeah. Like, I want some backstory. I want to yeah. feel connected. Yeah. I want to know that it's also the other thing about this kind of porn. They call it ethical porn. Is that it's you know that it's made consensually. The women are being paid well. They're okay. treated right. There a lot of times women are acting out their own fantasies, perhaps, and so it's porn that really caters to the female gaze and what we find hot and what our turn ons are. And so we are seeing more of that porn out there, but you got to look for it. You're not going to find it where you're finding all the other porn. And so that's another way that I think that you know the world is really shifting more towards women's pleasure. And so we're kind of all fighting these battles in our own relationships with men. Not fighting, but we're trying to bring new information in, but the world is also creating new resources, whether it's like lube that's made for our vaginas and not for a penis, or porn that's made for our our arousal and not just for men. Wow. Do you think that's a good resource for people who are trying, who want to learn more about sex? Yeah. Versus regular porn, which is creating a lot of problems? I think so. I think that that would be a great place to start is looking at that kind of porn. I think there's some great sites. There's one called OMG Yes. It's been around now for a while. I've and seen that one. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a great one for women learning their bodies and how yep. to touch themselves and how to figure out what, what, like, what do I actually do when I masturbate? Mm. I mean, I talk a lot about that a lot. That could be like a whole nother show, but where do I actually start? Mm. I've never touched myself. I don't know what to do. 
So it's just a site that you could actually, I think you buy a membership to it and you could really learn your parts and they give you all these different tips for touching yourself. Like what do you actually do with your fingers? What position are you in? What are the different, you know, yeah, ways to touch yourself. Uh, one of our friends was talking about now there's like even options for women like well men have these options when they go like the rub and tug places that they're for women in in spain spain yeah spain have some like i shouldn't what is it like not i guess it wouldn't be rub and tug for us it would be I, <laughs> smooth and licking yeah, i don't know exactly <laughs> touch and smooth i don't know finger i don't know <laughs> happy endings i don't know yeah. we need a better name for it but there are more places popping up i mean i care for women all the time who are like can you find me something like that? It's just not wow. legal here, but there are sexological body workers and there are things like, there are places you can go to find that, but usually they're not, yeah, it's still it's, not legal. Yeah. And unfortunately, um, you have to find scared. them privately. Do you think it should be legal? I do. Yeah. I do think that some sex work, a lot of it should should be legalized um, because there's a lot of it, there's like a great service for, for first off, like it's the oldest profession since the beginning of time, right? Women like prostitution. But when we're talking about like sexological body work, there are a lot of practitioners. What I mean by that is they actually study female bodies, male bodies, and they know how to help people um, mm -hmm. through certain blocks they have mm -hmm. around being touched, around arousal, desire. Um, maybe women have aren't able to let go. I mean, that's a, the, the big challenge is like, for women, we don't naturally let go either. So even like the point of having an orgasm and having pleasure takes some real embodiment and getting out of our heads. Mm. And so if you work with someone who's experienced in sexuality, a safe person who's trained and has a certificate and degree and you're in a safe place, and they could actually help you in the safety of a client-patient relationship, you know, work through things, I think it is really healthy. I think mm. I read somewhere once that, um it, that was how doctors used to treat mania in board housewives. Vibrators. Yeah, right? Well. You would know more about yes. this. Can, can you can you elaborate? Yeah. I mean, this is... So, boredom? Was that boredom? Um, it wasn't boredom. No. no. It was depression or it mania. It was depression or mania. Okay, so here's yeah. another problem with female sexuality. They used to call it hysteria. This yes. goes back to Freud. And it's really problematic because women who were feeling sexually frustrated or were having hormonal challenges, they were like, she's crazy. She probably just needs an orgasm. And they would go into men's offices and they would use a vibrator and then the women would have an orgasm. And they were like, oh, we're solving women's craziness and mania. Oh my but what God. we don't understand <laughs> is that there's this? been so this. Like the 19th this like, no, not even like the, the 50s, wow. 60s. Yep, not yep. that long, honestly, like not that long ago. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if the study of human sexuality in the United States was only like in the late 50s with the Kinsey Institute, and that's probably when a lot of these studies were happening was like the late 50s, early 60s, and probably up until the 70s. I mean, a lot. I mean, the clitoris wasn't even on the political on the political on, on the map um, medically until the late 90s. No, wow. yeah, there were wow. medical journals. So we're saying like we are still so playing poor catch up. Lady yeah, out there. I know. <laughs> and so this whole thing of hysteria, we've just never understood women's hormones mm. and what happens different times of month like when we get our periods and we're menstruating and there's all this like women are crazy they're hysterical no we've got this surge of hormones that are racing through our bodies and they're going to affect our mood they're going to affect our desire they're going to affect the way we act and so just sort of playing with that again everything's been women have been targeted as like being crazy or being insane or we're moody or we we're frigid and it's just like if we understand the entire mechanism of our bodies and our arousal process, then, you know, we'd be much more set up. But yeah, that is that is true that they would use vibrators for women, but it's still, which is great to under, start to understand female sexuality, but it was just very limited. And was it true in the 70s that um, doctors would prescribe uh, Molly, I guess, what's the... What's MDMA. The, MDMA. MDMA to couples to like yeah. break the... The intent. monotony. Yeah. There has been a lot of therapeutic uses for MDMA. And as we know, it's gone underground and now it's having a resurgence right now. But yeah, definitely MDA is a heart opener and it can really help couples connect, feel more in their bodies, feel more connected. So yeah, it definitely was started to be used for that in the 70s and the 80s. And I think MDMA was definitely like clamped down upon in the 80s. But now again, we're seeing more... Um, people train now in like therapy sessions, therapy sessions around yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, I like think it's great. Therapy, I'm, I'm all for therapy. psychedelic therapy. 
yeah. mushrooms, so away. <laughs> psilocybin, MDMA, yeah. like that is a game changer right now. Wow. Especially living in California. Like yeah. there's mm -hmm. people doing this and I think it's fantastic. Yeah. Better than saying, you know, what else they prescribe women who have low desire sometimes or hysteria is they give them antidepressants mm. or they give them a pill and you know, there's like desire pills. I don't think they work because they work on different mechanisms in the brain. But again, if the brain is the largest sex organ, psychedelics could really help us open up in a safe place that I think it could be really a game changer for women. And we've seen it already. Wow, yeah. amazing. Yeah, Shanina and I are massively on board with that. We, we do changa, <laughs> which is um, ayahuasca. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay, I've not done that yet, but you've you've gone on like journeys yeah. for weeks and yeah. And things. I can see how that would, especially emotionally, unblock. Um, I mean, you could work on your shame. Yeah, <laughs> doing ayahuasca. Yeah, yeah. So. it's not like a whole hour session, and the chunga is like literally like a six minute thing, and it's like you're in and out, and you're you can function afterwards. And it's like you know how? Oh, I don't yeah, know. Okay, so I've done the toad. Which is also just short, you know, about five meo DMT. Yeah. Five meo yeah. DMT. Yeah. No, this is yeah. like a mix of like DMT, um, ayahuasca, but it you ah. can smoke it and um, you're in it for like five six minutes oh, wow. and then you function and it just like it's. I think it's been. I didn't know that I would ever do this, but it releases trauma and just in so many different aspects and like shame or you know, yeah. it, it keeps us open. Absolutely. Well, yeah. we didn't even get into shame and trauma, which is actually one of the biggest things that's keeping us from pleasure is that we have so much shame our bodies hold on to every experience we've ever had and and it can block us from pleasure or maybe we grew up in an environment where you're we told sex wasn't okay and we're still carrying those shameful messages or abuse maybe abuse any kind of abuse yeah physical abuse emotional abuse i mean things that we've gone up with it lives in our bodies and so a lot of psychedelics can be really like your experience can be so helpful at releasing trauma and it actually can be a lot more effective than just talk therapy yeah so i'm a huge fan I mean, find a practitioner and yeah. do this work. I can I can connect with that. I think they had a lot of shame around, especially in my career and in industry, like modeling. And I've had probably a like very um, narcissistic, selfish partner and talking about my body. Yeah. And I think that probably brought trauma with me sure going into other relationships yeah. and not feeling good about my body and then not feeling like I can arouse my partner too, but I'm always like thinking about the other person because I just wanted to take the avoidance off me. But a lot around showing my body because yeah. I wasn't, I was, yeah, I had shame around it. I didn't feel confident. Which is just so insane that anyone yeah. would ever make you feel like that. But yeah. it happened. No, it happened. But I yeah. love, no, but here's the thing is that, is that those are the things, it just takes one partner shaming us and this happens to men too like one woman said your penis wasn't big enough or you got shamed in the locker room or for women one partner saying like you don't know what you're doing or you have weird boobs or your vaginas yeah this sticks with us for our entire lives it mm. can mm. unless we go in and do the work to pinpoint that and release it and realize like that is not me that is not the truth this is like one person said something to harm me usually we say these things to harm our partners to make them feel less than and to manipulate them. It's like very manipulative, but doing this kind of work around like trauma or EMDR therapy, which is like a process of, of, of re kind of reprocessing traumatic memories around certain events mm. that I feel like this, that is the work that we could all be doing. Cause we all have trauma, whether it's like big T trauma or a little T trauma. Yeah. But just the fact that you even know that, that that mm -hmm. happened to you and that like you're sharing that is so, is so, you know, it doesn't have a hold on you anymore in the same way. Yeah. But to know that that's still there, like getting to the root of our shame, like where did it come from? How do I, I call this my book, The Pleasure Thieves. And I say it's stress, trauma, and shame are the three things that's keeping us from pleasure and, and from sex and from connection. And we have to unpack those. Like that is our life's work. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you're ever done because it shows up in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. um, shame is probably the biggest one, but even just if you're anxious or stressed in your life, it's gonna yes. be hard to connect to your body. Mm -hmm. um, and again, if you've had any trauma, just because it's been a long time since something happened, people think, well, it was so long ago. Like, no, no, no. Like it's had more time to sort of fester and to sort of clamp on to your internal organs, your internal, your body structure, your fascia, like it lives in your body. So whatever we can do to release it, movement therapy, rolling on a roller, um, yoga, scream therapy, you know, like just getting it out and yeah. processing it. Yeah. And for people who want to learn more about, you know, the different ways they can improve 
their sex lives, their sexual wellness. You have a lot of resources. Oh my God, I have a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you go to, so my podcast is Sex with Emily. We release two a week. I've got thousands of episodes. Um, we've got, a, we, every day we release different articles and blogs on our site. I've got videos. It's all Sex with Emily everywhere, truly. And my book is Smart Sex. That has everything. That's like the Bible. Mm -hmm. And then we also have our shop site. Like Valentine's I said, we just launched this Valentine's Day is coming Yay. up. So we do have a special code for your listeners. It's code 8020. Let me make sure that that's right. I think I don't know if there's any dashes in there or anything. Let's you just make sure. Amazing. That that's... Wow. Yay. I'll be going shopping. 80, 8020 <laughs> at shopsexwithemily.com. You can get 20% off your entire order. Wow. Which is kind of major. I've got sex toys, I've got gift packages. Um, just literally lubes, everything that I've talked about. And I have to say it's the best product out there. Like I've curated it. So it's just things that I've tried that are body safe that could, and we have a lot of articles around it that explains how to use it. Cause that's the other thing. Like so many people are like, I got a toy now what do I do? So we kind of walk you through that whole process. Um, amazing. And of course there's your masterclass. Oh, my masterclass. My masterclass is amazing. You can get that at masterclass, masterclass.com if you get, dot com if you get a subscription to masterclass. That's amazing. I'm going to be having more courses coming out this year. I'm actually going to be doing, if people go to my website, I think this is when this is coming out, and I have a, I think it's going to be, it might be a little bit earlier than February 11th, but it's a one-time course that I'm doing over Zoom answering everyone's questions, so they can go sign up for that as well. Oh, wow. Oh, amazing. It's my birthday and Valentine's Day. I'm in that sweet it's spot. It's your birthday. Happy February birthday. 11th, February 14th, so. Okay. Yeah. Happy birthday. That's a great time. Because the thing about Valentine's Day is it doesn't have to be like chocolates yeah. and dinner, but like it's the one day that we're saying, please focus on your intimate life. I think it's great. A lot of people don't like it, but also we're talking about like the scheduling of sex. I think like Valentine's Day opens up that opportunity to like play, have fun. And also like I think for me and when I feel my best with my partner and like in like sexual experiences or sessions is like the connection and the communication. Yes. And so like the date night and then the lingerie or whatever it may be like, or just doing something fun. I think I, I like Valentine's Day. Or, yeah. and if you're single, maybe like you said, time play to play with yourself. Play, yeah, yeah. No, I was gonna say we should normalize making it a self love day. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Why not? It's a, it, we have a gift, we have a gift guide that's all about Buy one for your 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 best friend for yourself because it is a day of love. Even yeah. if you're not in a relationship, what what can you do to enhance a connection with yourself? And I just remember the Kegel exerciser. It's called Yarlap. Okay, Y A R L A P. Right. It just popped into my brain. Um, but there's just like buy yourself some Kegel weights. Like do something mm. for yourself. Mm. Start on this journey. Start on this path. It's okay if this is all new for you and you haven't really thought about it. Like start where you're at. And there's so much information that can help everybody feel good in their bodies and have more pleasure. That's important. Amazing. Oh. Well, we've Thanks both for... learned so much today. So Thank much. you, Dr. Emily Thanks Moore. Thanks for having Thank me. You. This was so fun, you guys. Thank oh, you. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks and for people me. can find you at sexwithemily.com and sexwithemily on all social media, TikTok, Instagram. We're everywhere. Amazing. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.